It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, th I thought I ended up in the wrong conference this morning. I was, uh, there were people at the hotel who were wearing big name badges, so I went up and introduced myself, uh, assumed they were part of the same uh, conference, and they were here to, uh, on a large conference, uh, five or 600 people on uh, battlefield preservation. And I thought, wow. <laughs> um, so what I want to talk about is this, uh, uh, the military entertainment complex. Um, you probably are aware that the, the face of war has changed uh, significantly since the end of the Cold War. One of the major changes that I've been following uh, is the way that, military, that, that the military plans and trains for war. A key new element in military training in the 1990s uh, was the introduction of very large-scale computer-based uh, simulation. Flight simulators, of course, uh, and, and simulators of all sorts uh, for uh, training the use of specific pieces uh, of expensive equipment, including uh, the space shuttle, uh, had been around uh, since the, the, the 1960s. What was new in these developments of the 1990s was the interconnection of large numbers uh, of individual simulators into complex uh, multi-level network simulations. One of the key movers in this new era of high-tech military training was STRICOM, um, uh, which was activated in August of 1992. Uh, STRICOM stands for the Simulation Training and Instrumentation Command. Uh, and it was tasked with providing training and test simulation simulators and instru uh, instrument instrumentation products uh, uh, used to develop and sustain warfighting skills for America's Army. Their motto was, all but war is simulation. Well, it didn't take long for the proponents of distributed simulation to discover they shared mutual interests with the video game and digital inter entertainment industries. Part of the large story, uh, of, of that larger, much larger story, is uh, relevant to uh, my story today. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on uh, when I discuss efforts uh, to uh, recycle some of this uh, technology for turning uh, uh, for peace and conflict resolution, a project that I think of as uh, turning uh, swords to plowshares. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the changes that have gone on, and I lost my little widget. What did I do? There it is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so really a, a kind of sense of urgency tempered by optimism compels me to engage uh, in, this, uh, in this effort, and I hope a lot of you will join this kind of effort as well. Not only the way that the U.S. military trains for war has changed, uh, the nature of armed conflict has also radically changed in the last uh, two decades. During the 1990s, after four decades of steady increase, uh, the number of wars uh, being fought around the world suddenly declined. Uh, uh, wars have also become progressively less deadly since the 1950s. By the century's end, the world was experiencing what some uh, uh, rather optimistic folks were calling uh, uh, the longest period of uninterrupted peace uh, in, Amer in uh, the history of uh, uh, traditional powers in hundreds, in hundreds of years. The vast majority of today's conflicts uh, are so-called low-intensity civil wars. And here in this graph, you see in the blue sections there uh, uh, the, the large number of intrastate conflicts. These are conflicts that are between armed groups, militias, civil wars, and things of that sort, not the sort of things that are perpetrated by a government against another, another government, but are uh, pretty much the sorts of things that we're seeing in Africa uh, and, uh, to a certain extent, uh, in the Middle East. Um, almost all of which uh, are, are, of these wars are taking place in the developing world. They are typically fought by relatively small, ill-trained, lightly armed forces that avoid military engagements, but frequently target civilians, and that's the troubling issue. 
While often conducted with great brutality, these low intensity conflicts uh, kill relatively few people compared with the major con uh, conventional wars that have traditionally been fought between large nations. Changes in the scope uh, and deadliness uh, of armed conflicts have been paralleled by other global shifts in military recruitment and organization. Um, these have been driven in part by economic considerations uh, and in part by political changes. Three changes that prompt considerable alarm are a reliance on child soldiers, uh, the increasing use of paramilitary forces, uh, and uh, the uh, outsourcing, the privatization of warfare, the outsourcing of military security to private firms, uh, a, a kind of in endeavor that the U.S. government is engaged in. And what this slide shows you is that of these, the number of conflicts, uh, state conflicts, campaigns perpetrated by governments has remained relatively low and stable over the, over the last uh, uh, several years since the end of the Cold War. Uh, but non-state armed groups have been responsible for most of the warfare. Most of this, of this uh, warfare has taken place in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which you see in the, the last of the, of the charts, um, uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, uh, and in the Americas. And of course, the, one of the, the key issues in all of these, uh, this area of warfare are uh, uh, international terrorist attacks, and you get a variety of, uh, you get a variety of different kinds of data on uh, terrorist attacks depending upon which government agency you, you focus on. Uh, but uh, if you count significant terrorist attacks as accounted by the State Department, they show an, uh, an alarming eightfold increase over the last several years. Well, if there's any good news uh, in all of this, uh, it is that, um, <clears throat> that more conflicts are ending in negotiated settlements than ever before in history, and that negotiated settlements outnumber uh, outright victories by four to one. Sorry for this rather gigantic chart, but what I want to show you uh, is some data on this. So if you look here, uh, 17 to four of, vic of, of uh, conflicts that ended in victory by one side or another uh, versus conflicts that are in, in, in negotiations between 2000 and two, uh, 2005, a four to one increase. The problem with, this, uh, with these negotiated settlements, however, uh, and that's a very promising thing, is uh, that unfortunately they don't last. Uh, as we see here uh, from 1990 through 99, 42 uh, negotiated settlements ended up uh, coming undone and having and uh, various further conflict uh, continued. Um, the data for 2000 uh, to 2005 show uh, uh, that wasn't what I wanted to do. <laughs> Shows a uh, a more interesting up upward swing, 17. Uh, but even then, we're not 11.8 uh, percent. We're not sure that. Uh, uh, that counts all of the all of the data. So, the point of this is that if we are going to turn the corner and move toward a more peaceful future, tools are needed uh, for training the future negotiators of international organizations and non-governmental organizations uh, in the knowledge and in the skills needed to create effective conflict settlements uh, that last. And what follows, I want to discuss one proposal that I think of as recycling the military entertainment complex as an, op as an opportunity for achieving this sort of objective. So let me begin by uh, discussing <clears throat> the origins uh, of what I call the military entertainment complex. Contrary to uh, initial expectations, the military, uh, industrial com the military industrial complex, first coined by Dwight Eisenhower in the late 1950s, uh, did not fade away with the end of the Cold War. It, was, it has simply reorganized itself. In fact, uh, I would say it is more efficiently organized than it ever was before. Indeed, a cynic like me might argue that whereas the military industrial complex was more or less visible and identifiable, during the Cold War. Today it is invisibly everywhere. 
permeating our daily lives. The military industrial complex has become the military entertainment complex. The entertainment industry is both a major source of innovative ideas uh, and technology and the training ground for what might be called uh, post-human warfare. How has this change come about? In the 1990s, with the end of the Cold War, came uh, an emphasis uh, on uh, fiscally efficient uh, military built on sound business practices, with military procurement interfacing seamlessly uh, with industrial manufacturing processes. Uh, Secretary of State William Perry instituted the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act of 1994, which directed a move away from the, the Department of Defense's uh, historical reliance on, uh, on a wide group of contractors uh, with dedicated segments of the U.S. technology and industrial base. The shift in policy radically transformed the fields of computer simulation and training. Throughout the 30-year history of these fields, uh, now probably more than 30 years uh, of, of these fields, um, uh, developments in, uh, uh, in computer graphics, uh, networking, and artificial intelligence have always been driven by demands of military and aerospace uh, 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 needs because of the importance of simulation technology to military training. Currently, in fact, the simulation budget for the U.S. military uh, alone constitutes 10% of the U.S. Uh, of U.S. annual military spending. In this context, the shift in procurement policy and immediate consequences uh, for the relations between military contractors in the simulation business and the entertainment industry. From the late 1980s through the mid-1990s, the game industry, including video games, console games, uh, uh, PC games and so forth, uh, was growing at an extremely brisk pace. A number of high-end military contractors decided to spin off uh, some of their products into the game market. Evans & Sutherland, for example, a major producer of standalone flight and tank simulators, uh, repurposed uh, some of its uh, simulation technology for arcade games. Uh, similarly, uh, the largest military contractor at that time, Martin Marietta, spun off Real 3D, a company founded on several of its uh, major patents in graphic chip design. Real 3D contracted with Sega uh, to produce its next generation arcade game platforms. Um, Silicon Graphics made a major move in contracting with Nintendo to produce the graphics boards for the PlayStation. Uh, and the extremely uh, successful Super Mario Brothers series uh, um, uh, uh, came out of that. So successful was this venture that Silicon Graphics management admitted that while their heart was still in the business of, of uh, medical and scientific uh, simulation, company revenues were, were mainly flowing from the game console market and a number of people left Silicon Graphics in the late 1990s to found another company that you're all familiar with because it runs the chips in most of our laptops today, NVIDIA, especially if you're a video game player. The new policies resulted uh, in a flow, uh, not only of technology from the military uh, to the entertainment industry, but of highly talented people as well. Stephen Woodcock, for example, a designer of artificial intelligence components for the military simulation network, SimNet, uh, moved to Real 3D, the company I mentioned a second ago, where he helped design uh, popular games, including a number of games that became quite popular, before he then went back to work in the, uh, the, the military contracting business. Um, two other SimNet warriors, Warren Katz and John Morrison, founded uh, Make uh, Software, specializing in the construction of very large-scale uh, simulation training environments. In fact, they're uh, their company in Boston wants to produce uh, simulators uh, as large as entire cities. Um, but they also uh, 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 produce uh, 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 commercial games. An illustration of this new era of open collaboration between the military and commercial sectors, Make produced a war game called Spearhead under a contract to the Marines, which was simultaneously released uh, as uh, a co a commercial game differing only in certain uh, classified details from the uh, commercial product. 
This flow of technology, however, has been bi-directional. Uh, they also had a uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit 2000, which was a network multiplayer 3D uh, game that was released simultaneously as a commercial product and as a uh, military simulation. But this flow of technology has been bi-directional. Upholding its new policy to use off-the-shelf technology, uh, the military has adapted game software to its own purposes. The reason is obvious. The game industry has advanced rapidly in the last decades, taking advantage of hardware developments to produce spectacular realistic graphic displays and games with increasingly sophisticated AI components. Game software now outstrips the best the military uh, has to offer. Consider uh, uh, the military's adoption of Falcon 4.0 a few years ago as the training program for its F-16 fighter pilots. Falcon 4.0 mimicked the look and feel uh, of real military aircraft and allowed users to play against uh, computer-generated forces or, in the network version, uh, against um, um, other pilots, uh, facilitating team training uh, opportunities. This video game's extreme realism led to work with Spectrum Holobyte uh, to modify the, the flight simulator uh, uh, for a uh, game as a simulator for military training. Well, just as the, the military uh, has leveraged the commercial sector for advanced technology, the game industry has pursued the open source community for some of its hottest developments, and some of you may actually be contributors uh, to this whole uh, round of developments. This pattern began uh, with uh, id Software's release of the code for its path-breaking first-person shooter game, Doom, so that shareware gamers uh, could modify the game by adding new rooms and levels, uh, game modifications, mods. id followed this innovative step by making available the scripting language uh, for its hit game, Quake, uh, which uh, also rad radically changed the level of interactivity uh, in games. A large shareware community of gamers has evolved, contributing tools from level editors to scripting languages uh, for creating new environments and even changing the look and feel uh, uh, of the games. Other developers have followed suit, allowing players to alter their computer, com uh, uh, their computer opponents in direct fashion through scripts and code plugins. This entire development has spilled over into the production of network games, uh, such as uh, Counter-Strike. And I don't know if many of you play or have played Counter-Strike, but uh, when I was still at Stanford, it was very difficult to get on, uh, on the uh, servers at night, uh, simply because there were so many students playing Counter-Strike that uh, would uh, bring the network down occasionally. Um, and so this whole, whole level of this shareware movement, I think, is totally crucial. People like Ben Morris, who were not really part of any company, were, uh, developed the Doom Construction Kit and then Worldcraft, which was a, an editing tool, a level editing and a scripting tool. Tim Sweeney uh, uh, developed in that same fashion Unreal, Unreal Script, which became uh, the basis for a lot of uh, Valve's uh, uh, computer games, particularly Half-Life, uh, released in 1998 that was constructed with Worldcraft. Uh, Counter-Strike uh, was a game that was developed uh, using these tools by a group of basically high school students in the Seattle area and actually distributed all over the country. Uh, really fantastically famous group of people who've gone on to do a bunch of other kinds of things uh, 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 built around uh, terrorism, anti-terrorism themes. Uh, you've seen the screens, the highly realistic screens of this, and I have a clip I'd like to show, if I can get it to work, uh, of, of these things in action. So just to give you, uh, just to remind you, those of you who have never had the pleasure of playing Doom as much as I have, uh, this is the, the way the original Doom uh, looked actually on a pretty good graphics card. <laughs> Most of the graphics cards we had didn't really uh, were totally pixelated, uh, much more so than this one. Um, and uh, uh, this then was was uh, the the source code for this was put on the web and opened up for other people uh, who began uh, uh, developing it. And then the look and feel of this game was was. Uh, the basis for Half-Life, Half-Life 2, probably the greatest this game that's ever been made as far as I can tell. Uh, 
looks somewhat familiar. The time is eight. Then note the environment and the way you move around uh, with the aliens uh, as it then is transformed uh, by uh, this group of modders into Counter-Strike, which is probably one of the most popular games of all time. So, um, so just as uh, the military uh, has, um, uh, the, use, uh, the U.S. military, uh, uh, it uh, didn't uh, take long in joining the fun of modifying games as well. In 1996, uh, a group of marine simulation experts from the Marine uh, Corps Modeling and Simulation Management Office acquired the shareware version of Doom and adapted it uh, as a military fire team simulation with software tools developed uh, by shareware Doom gamers on the internet. Real world images were scanned into the game files so that 3D scans of G.I. Joe action figures uh, um, uh, replace the stock game monsters from uh, the old version of Doom. The game was also modified from its original version uh, to include fighting holes, bunkers, tactical, uh, uh, tactical wire, uh, the fog of war, and even friendly fire. Marine Doom trainees used uh, uh, Marine issue assault rifles to shoot it out with uh, enemy combat troops in a variety of terrain uh, and building configurations. The simulator, simulation was actually even used uh, for a specific mission in the Balkans immediately prior uh, to the engagement. Well, such developments uh, encouraged several top officials in the military simulation command to seek more formal collabor collaborative relations with the video game uh, and entertainment industries. And in fact, they organized uh, a very large-scale meeting uh, at, by the Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. that resulted uh, in this volume, Modeling and, Modeling and Simulation, Linking Entertainment and Defense, uh, as an outcome. And following up, uh, one of the uh, recommendations made by that uh, Academy of Sciences uh, report uh, is that there should be some sort of large-scale involvement in support of the military with the entertainment industries, which led to uh, a $45 million DARPA uh, contract to, uh, um, to uh, Southern, Southern California, University of Southern California, for its, uh, the creation of its Institute for Creative Technologies, which was uh, recently renewed just last year, another uh, uh, quite a bit larger than $45 million this time. Um, this uh, project uh, was, um, uh, the, the ICT has done a number of very interesting things, uh, but in addition to developing simulation technologies and immersive environments, a variety of different kinds of academic programs, they've also been producing on a regular basis video games that are both simulations for military as well as popular games, this one being one of the more notable full spectrum warrior. Um, you can see the ICT logo there in the middle uh, at the bottom. Uh, America's Army uh, uh, Operations was another military-funded games project launched about the same time uh, as the ICT, in Institute for Creative Technologies. This project was the brainchild of West Point uh, economist and director of the Office of Economic Manpower Assessment, Casey, Colonel Casey Wardensky. Um, and it was also supported and led by uh, Michael Zaida, who is a computer scientist and professor at the um, MOVES Institute, that is the uh, Modeling, Simulation, and Virtual Environments Institute at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Uh, great place to study, I have to say. Zaida tapped directly into the open source movement in building the game which was distributed for free on the internet. This project uh, initially had a quite a different purpose, however, from the projects launched uh, at the ICT. America's Army was released on Independence Day 2002, the traditional uh, summer blockbuster date in the entertainment industry, um, um, and it was intended uh, uh, primarily as a recruiting device. Produced with brilliant graphics and the Unreal game engine, 
the most advanced uh, computer game, uh, commercial game engine then available at a cost of around $8 million. The game is a first-person multiplayer combat simulation, I'm sure some of you have played this, uh, that requires players to complete several preliminary stages of combat training uh, 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 before uh, going on and, and participating in, in group missions and getting assignments and going out uh, here at the military's own training grounds, uh, not far from where I'm currently located. Uh, it is a, a kind of cyber boot camp. And the interesting thing is that, uh, from my perspective, is a, a lot of other modules have been developed into this uh, simulation. So here what you see is the kind of thing you have to do if you want to be, uh, if, you, if you want to play a medic or if you want to be a medic in the military. Uh, you go through medic training and here these guys are sitting, you have to sit in a whole bunch of lectures. You can't just go out and start playing around. You have to start, you have to acquire certain kinds of skills and pass certain tests before you can get in uh, as a medic. And there are a variety of other kinds of roles that you can play in the game, all of which require uh, the, uh, the use of simulation. Now, the, uh, I'm very interested in this game, uh, and you'll see why later on, but the, the interesting thing to me was uh, what it was as a marketing uh, platform. Basically, Wardensky had done a cost-benefit analysis to see how it was going to be possible to persuade young people like you, uh, uh, or most of you, to, uh, to join the military. Uh, and uh, one of the kinds of things that you'll see is they have ads on TV for football games, or they, have, uh, they sponsor a NASCAR racer, and those cost millions and millions of dollars. It's not clear you're actually hitting the right audience with, uh, with those ads. And, uh, it turns out that uh, most uh, a substantial intersection then uh, exists between the population of people that uh, America's army is trying to reach uh, and those people who play video games. Um, and uh, this is their cost-benefit analysis. And what Wardensky and the, the, uh, uh, his people decided was that this was a very good way uh, to uh, create a strategic communication advantage to get at tech-savvy young people. 77% uh, of males at West Point class have played games like uh, uh, America's Army. Uh, and uh, it turns out that gamers do better in certain kinds of tests and certain kinds of uh, uh, things that you'd like them to be good at in the military. Um, but the main thing was uh, not only trying was not only trying to you know recruit people, but recruit people who uh, wanted to stay in the military, uh, and this required changing the image of the army as the sort of physically demanding, uh, less interesting, tough and dangerous kind of work uh, into something more exciting. So what you wanted to do was to give people. Uh, a, a sense of what the kind of career options are and what sorts of things they would actually be doing in the military uh, when they signed up. Um, uh, this was really a, a key uh, factor, namely to uh, explore the spectrum of experiences from the barracks uh, to the battlefield uh, that could be engaging and fun. Um, but even more important, and I think from my perspective, this is the, really the most important thing that, that was behind uh, America's Army, or has been behind America's Army, is that it uh, is a kind of uh, piece of ideological warfare. Uh, it's really, it's, what's really um, important about America's Army uh, is the way that it conveys the values and norms of the U.S. military, and that's its primary objective to get those values and norms out there uh, uh, with the people who play the game. Uh, so, and this is so that uh, a player, you know, you want duty, respect, selfless uh, service, honor, integrity, and, and personal courage, those values uh, of, the, uh, of the army to, to be the things that uh, people sign up for. And those are encouraged in the game through honor levels, uh, increasing honor levels when you uh, are, are part of a team that achieves its mission objective, when you participate as a leader, uh, you survive the mission, you secure objectives. Uh, if you fire on a, a, uh, one of your local, your own team members, or uh, particularly if you shoot at your staff sergeant, you get sent to the brig. And if you've ever played the game, you know it's not easy to get out of the brig. You sit there for a long time doing nothing in the game, which is really a drag. And that's, uh, but so the point that, that they want to make is that the content uh, can put uh, self-selection uh, to work uh, for the army. 
those young people will choose the army, and at the same time, the army can screen them because the game is instrumented. When you sign up and play America's Army, uh, your statistics are being recorded, and if you choose to allow your handle to be, uh, uh, you know, reported to uh, to your recruiter, uh, they can tell you, can give you a readout of what they think would be the most optimal kinds of uh, 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 rewarding job for you in the military. Um, and so uh, players will develop their game character from entry training to advanced schools and leadership positions and a variety of things have, uh, are there to, to help you do that. But I want to show you, just give you a sense of, the, of the, the way that they've marketed this uh, game. Maybe some of you were at the Game Developers Conference in... Uh, Now, a, a frequent trope that appears in uh, the vision statements of various architects of the military entertainment complex is the goal of fusing the virtual and the real. The idea of, of having a simulation and training take place under such realistic seeming conditions that the simulation cannot be uh, taken as a substitute for the real, but might actually be an interface of command and control uh, uh, to the real event itself. A frequent rec reference used by, cyber, uh, by these cyber warriors is Ender's Game. I don't know if you've ever read it, but if you hadn't, I'm sure you'd love, uh, you'd love it. In this Orson Scott card tale, Ender Wiggins, a young student in a futuristic battle school uh, that uses video games as training modules, is tricked into thinking that the final exam for his training course is just a game where he must lead an invasion on uh, more than a thousand alien ships who are trying to colonize uh, planet Earth. It turns out, however, that the exam is not a simulation at all, but the interface to the actual final conflict which has been going on with invaders in which Ender annihilates the alien race. Well, in August 2003, the MOVES Institute at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey held a celebration in an open house of the new modules uh, that were in the pipeline for America's Army. Pretty glitzy uh, organization, as I was just showing you some of the kinds of things that they do. Um, in, in, um, in his talk uh, at the event, uh, Jack Thorpe, who was the original architect of the military simulation network, SimNet, uh, uh, mused on the possibility of realizing the fantasy of the Battleplex in Ender's Game with versions of, with the newest versions of America's Army or with versions that could come out in the near future. It would be relatively easy uh, to do near time, real time, uh, near to real time rendering of local environments in Iraq, for example, he says, uh, captured by satellite and update versions uh, 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 of the game where the U.S. Special Forces could coordinate their assault with friendly local Iraqi forces. The scenario Thorpe described was predicated on creating a mod culture uh, in which friendly local forces would collaborate in support of uh, American military objectives. And he says in the talk, uh, you know, this is a sort of proactive pedagogy. If there's no difference between the virtual and the live, the instructive and the real, then eventually we're going to be able to execute and these things are all going to be at the same place. And it allows us, he says, to think about putting out a game that's played worldwide and allows people to solve some particular problem that up to now only very specialized groups like the US Special Forces could solve. 
targets could be named publicly online by elements of a population, not all of which are at war with you, friendly forces in Iraq, for example, uh, and that deal with the will of the people and change the will of the people and look at the key mechanisms. Uh, personally, I find this kind of scary. <laughs> uh, I find it a, a kind of use of modding technology that uh, uh, is, um, is a little over the top. Uh, but it turns out not to be uh, so far-fetched. This idea of creating games that are modeled from actual events and ongoing engagements was already in the works before September 11, 2001. In October 2001, uh, Rival Inter uh, Interactive released a game called Real War, uh, which had been commissioned by the Office of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, uh, Real War was based on official military simulation called Joint Forces Employment. The only difference between the two versions was that the military version uh, contained more learning objectives and the player only had a finite number of uh, military resources, tanks, planes, and stuff. Visually, the game uh, uh, play is nearly identical. Real War is particularly notable for its premise. A U.S. war against terrorism created entirely before September 11th. Now, the idea of... of uh, uh, playing the news uh, was taken to an entirely new level by uh, a company called uh, Kuma Reality Games. Uh, created by uh, developer uh, Kuma Reality Games, Kuma War in 2004 was a, a free first person, it still is in, in existence by the way, third person shooter uh, episodic game uh, that recreates real world conflicts. Many of its missions are just weeks or even days old. Uh, in video game format, using uh, uh, information called from news accounts, uh, military experts, Department of Defense records, uh, and even original research. A new episode is uh, turned out uh, each month, consisting of a playable mission, uh, extensive background information, uh, a, a library, a multimedia library of various kinds of resources you can use, including interviews with various military people, satellite images, and so forth. Missions like Spring Break Fallujah, uh, released in 2004, and uh, Battle uh, in Sadr City, 2005, allowed the player to engage in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Assault on Iran, released in 2005, even anticipates America's potential further engagement by carefully changing the depiction of enemies uh, from Iraqis to Iranians. Headlines to the front lines. We put you there. Introducing Kuma War, an intense boots on the ground experience of actual news events occurring around the world right now. When an event occurs, we want to be able to put that into people's hands within three weeks. We released the first part of our Fallujah mission while the Battle of Fallujah was still going on. Events are developing in Fallujah as we speak. We don't wait till the event is 100% done. We had a good sense of what areas we were going to operate. We had satellite photos. Army and Marine Corps elements came down through these neighborhoods in the top. We understood you know, who was going to be fighting. We had developed the appropriate weapons. Day by day, we put together more and more of the mission. And essentially what we had done is we had laid out the chessboard. This was the town of Fallujah, and we had the pieces. So with materials uh, such as these, Kuma War has become, as you can imagine, the subject of a considerable controversy. Taking criticism for supporting the war, uh, its speed of release, its close relationship with the military, 
and its coverage of a number of divisive issues, uh, including the, poten uh, the potential for military action in Iran. Can such video games uh, play a serious journalistic role? Or do they misconstrue the real nature of war for voyeuristic thrills? Despite Jeff Plunkett and Jigar Mehta's uh, view explored in their excellent 2007 documentary, Playing the News, which I encourage you all to see, that games like Kuma War are a new way to engage young people in current events. My own view is that they verge on an unethical marketing, uh, an unethical marketing gimmick uh, uh, that merely seeks to exploit war. Do such games represent the future of journalism uh, or a dangerous blurring uh, of news and entertainment? Can we look forward to an Abu Ghraib video of some sort, or maybe even uh, uh, our own imagined version of a video game with this one? Well, there's good reason to think that, uh, if anything, these types of reality game fan the flames of conflict rather than furthering the cause of peace. The U.S. military uh, is using newly minted best practices of game design and business models to compete in the era arena for young, highly talented cyber warriors. But in a post-9-11 world, where distributed collaboration in a military context has come to signify terrorist cells, the potential mods based on the Unreal Engine conjure up an all too frightening potential reality. No doubt somewhere, either in the game industry itself or among the worldwide community of mod builders, a group is currently uh, developing a cyber terrorist game uh, based on attacking the computer infrastructure of a country, disabling its power grid, infiltrating its financial networks, and hacking into mainstream news media such as the New York Times to confuse the public about what's going on. But as I've argued, these games are focused as much on cyber ideological struggle as on military training. As we've seen, in addition to training collaborative action, Wardensky's major goal in uh, developing uh, America's Army was to inculcate values consistent with the U.S. Army's mission. The idea of building game mods uh, that counter what is perceived as the values of Western imperialism has not escaped organizations such as the Hezbollah. And they have created their own game mods from Counter-Strike that serve uh, uh, their interests in the same way, but counter to the efforts of the US military. And here was one game that, they con that Hezbollah constructed a couple of years back, built uh, on a mod uh, using the Counter-Strike mod and then uh, off of a game that, the US had re that a game company in the US had released called Delta Force. Uh, they called their game Special Force. Be a partner in the victory. Uh, you can recall that as the logo on uh, America's Army operations. Um, and each uh, uh, stage of, like these other reality games, each stage of the game is inspired by actual Hezbollah operations uh, that took place uh, uh, in the war between Israel uh, and Lebanon uh, in, two, in southern uh, Lebanon 2000. One of the really interesting features is that, you, like America's Army, you have to train uh, in the special force to be a member of the fighting force, and you train by target practice on uh, Israeli military people, such as Ariel Sharon. Here you can see some screenshots of the game. Uh, uh, it looks quite familiar if you've ever played uh, America's Army <laughs> or uh, Counter-Strike. Um, Now another example uh, is uh, the company in uh, the West Bank uh, called uh, Afkar Media, founded by uh, an engineer, uh, Radwan Kazmia. The first game that this company uh, released uh, was, uh, was supposed to serve uh, their goals was uh, Under Ash. It was an action game uh, starting with the conflict between Palestinians and Israeli soldiers at the Aqsa Mar uh, Mosque in Jerusalem, that's the, the Dome of the Rock. Kazmia explains that the game is directed to the youth and teenagers, uh, 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 but you know, it's, it's trying to uh, overcome the, the, the facts and ideas that they receive through other media related to the crimes and violence that the Israelis have launched. In addition to sensitive topics connected with assassinating and torturing children, which 
according to Cosmia and his, his uh, team, uh, they have uh, hard, hardcore documents to prove that torturing children uh, uh, has, has gone on. The main purpose of the goal uh, the, of the game, uh, he argues, uh, uh, was uh, to, was, uh, to uh, fill the leisure time of young people who were previously occupied with foreign games, which distort the facts in history and plant the notion that sovereignty is for power and violence, according to the American style. Um, the, op the opening game credits uh, uh, of the games start off with the Palestinian nation is dispossessed, their homes are being torn down, the land is taken, trees fallen, property confiscated, cities are being besieged. They are uh, put into jail, tortured, killed. The world ignores them. Uh, no one hears uh, their cries, no one cares about their, their rights. Uh, the game is really meant then as a kind of ideological struggle uh, 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 for rights as understood by Arab people. So it seems to me that it's probably too optimistic uh, to think that we can uh, break this cycle. But as uh, game maker theorists like uh, Ian Bogost and Gonzalo Frasca, who have started a really fantastic uh, thing called uh, Water Cooler Games, you should go online and check it out, or uh, Ian Bogost's uh, uh, site called uh, Persuasive Games, which is developed a bunch of really cool games like um, being a, uh, you are a, a, um, a game, it's a game you play in security lines in airports uh, uh, about the, the, the problems of security, or you can play the game of being a Kinko's employee uh, to see what uh, being part of a global capitalist enterprise is like. Um, but, um, if, if we take the lead of people like this, we might be able to construct our own mod movement to foster political critique and dialogue potentially capable of initiating change. In that spirit, I want to conclude this discussion with a project uh, that I'm currently engaged with that takes game environments designed by the U.S., uh, designed to support uh, and train the U.S. Special Forces and repurpose them for training workers in the field of peace and conflict resolution. Now, uh, a considerable body of scholarship has shown that computer games provide an environment for active, critical learning. Through games, one learns to appreciate the interrelationship of complex behaviors, uh, of all kinds of interaction of systems, and the formation of social groups. Um, the former CEO and, and head of Xerox PARC uh, um, said that if, if, if you want to hire you know, if, if he was asked today would, uh, uh, who would he hire to work in his organization, uh, he says that he would hire people who are playing um, uh, World of Warcraft because of all the skills that these people are exhibiting and organizing uh, their space and organizing the sort of raids that they do and the sort of complex sorts of things that are going on, uh, the sort of multitasking that are, that's happening and particularly the team coordinated effort. Um, uh, and games and social simulations are increasingly being used in training and teaching in a variety of, uh, of areas such as uh, management uh, and uh, economics, uh, psychology, sociology, and a variety of, uh, of other areas besides uh, military strategy. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, are, is really crucial about games uh, is that it opens up possibilities for simultaneous learning on many different levels. Players can learn from the contextual information that you put into the game, uh, uh, in, uh, and also other kinds of things embedded in the dynamics of the game. You know, things don't go, go so well, you've got to try something else. Uh, and uh, through the risks, benefits, and costs, uh, outcomes, and rewards of alternative strategies that result from uh, uh, decision making. So games can be very powerful tools in uh, uh, training very complex uh, training uh, leaders for very complex types of tasks. Um, now, educators in the field of uh, conflict resolution uh, have recognized the value of simulation and role-playing games for quite some time. In fact, 
major organizations like the UN, a variety of other kinds of organizations like the organization that uh, I'm collaborating with at Duke University, uh, the Duke uh, University of North Carolina Rotary Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution, routinely use very sophisticated role-playing games in their classes. The, 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 the materials for these role-playing games are volumes some, sometimes this thick that you have to go out and learn and so forth. And these are to train people to go into the field, uh, people who will be going to work for the, uh, uh, you know, for the UN or for various uh, uh, non-governmental organizations and so forth. And all of them uh, recognize that learning by doing bridges the gap between conflict resolution theory uh, and its practical application in a world of crises uh, requiring complex strategy, advocacy, problem solving, and adaptive thinking. Uh, we've been fortunate to win, uh, uh, in support of this project, uh, an award from the MacArthur Foundation to, uh, from their digital media and learning competition to support this uh, uh, development. And it is a development that we're uh, doing together with, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the company Virtual Heroes. And Virtual Heroes is in the business of making military simulations. They are the ones who took over the further development of America's army. And they have developed a variety of other sorts of, of uh, modules for training. Um, the thing that's interesting, however, uh, uh, about, this, uh, about this game, about, about working with, uh, in this context, that I find exciting, uh, is that it's not just playing a computer game. It's not just a game, but it, has, it is a learning environment that has, we can create a learning environment that has a lot of other sorts of things going on in it. Uh, so we use the Unreal Game Engine. We're just starting to work on this. Uh, and the Unreal Game Engine supports up to 32 players uh, simultaneously in the same network. Uh, and we can have people, uh, and we're in the process at the moment of scripting uh, 32 different uh, types of roles that people uh, play in uh, in various kinds of disaster relief scenarios and the sort of complicated negotiations and the sort of logistical support, uh, medical support, various kinds of things that have to be addressed, even issues like uh, uh, how to speak to the press so as not to give out the wrong information that confuses all of your collaborators. Uh, 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 how to coordinate activities between all of the different organizations that are there. So these are all different kinds of roles uh, uh, that people need to learn and uh, train on before they go into the field. Uh, and this game engine uh, has associated with it uh, some tools that Virtual Heroes has built for the U.S. military for the Special Forces uh, that allow real-time in-game assessment uh, and feedback. So that you can modify, you can actually modify the game. Uh, they use it for tossing in IEDs into a, a, an environment uh, and that see what happens, uh, how the people, how the uh, military group there uh, uh, deals with it. But it, it's really, uh, it's really a, a, a adaptive thinking and leadership training environment that is designed to train special forces people for negotiations. And that's a very interesting opportunity. The other thing that the environment uh, uh, affords is both an instructor and a stakeholder authoring interface. So I, as an instructor, for example, will be able to change the scenarios, to author multiple different kinds of scenarios pretty much on the fly. Uh, but it also allows stakeholders, uh, you know, participants in the game, uh, uh, the, game the, the people who are training in the game, uh, uh, to write their own narratives and be co-constructors of the narrative. And that's really crucial, that they participate uh, in, uh, in, in addressing these things. And then finally, the environment uh, uh, contains the possibility of after-action review. Everything that happens in the game, I don't know if any of you have played the newest version of Halo, Halo 3, the new Xbox version of Halo 3 incorporates a version where you can actually do game capture of all the play that's gone on inside uh, the game, and you can view it from any angle. And this is part of our environment. So this allows us to look as, at the kinds of behaviors that uh, an individual playing a particular role exhibited uh, in the, the simulation, and, and for the group to be able to critique that or to discuss it in various kinds of ways after action review. Um, so this is what the Special Forces Adaptive thinking and leadership training module currently looks like. 
I want to show you that in action, uh, and I want then to show you some things that we're going to do with it. And this is, so this is, a, 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 this is a, uh, an imagined kind of event that would happen in Iraq or Afghanistan where uh, a U.S. Special Forces person meets uh, an Afghan leader, um, militia leader or something, and there has to be some sort of negotiation, discussion. They want to get their, they want to collaborate on some issue. Uh, and to be frank, all of the missions that I've seen so far where these, dis where these discussions take place uh, always break down uh, into some form of uh, armed conflict. Uh, So here's the start of the thing. This is just screenshots at the moment, but then I'll uh, have a, a live action video of, of gameplay. And one of the things that you see here, sorry for it, it's pixelated when I converted this to video, uh, my video, it didn't work out so well. Notice the, notice on the, um, the bottom, you see various metrics. These are biometrics. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can instrument the game. You can instrument the players who are playing the game so that uh, they wear a, a little headband that measures perspiration, uh, uh, pulse rate, things of this sort. So you get, and there are various other ways you can instrument them so that you get uh, not only where the, the blue line uh, uh, is, a, is a measure of cognitive uh, uh, activity of the frontal lobe, and the red line is uh, measuring other kinds of things such uh, that to, to measure anxiety. And if I were to play this all the way through, you see here at a certain point the thing flatlines, the, the anxiety part flatlines, and you'll see if you were watching the whole video, you'd see that that's where the guy uh, gets into a, a firefight with somebody else. There are no breath sounds on the left side. Oh, uh, patient must have a, a pneumothorax. Oh. Why don't you uh, decompress the chest for me, Red? Decom so I'll stop it for a second. So you can see that, so you as an individual uh, trainee in this program operates uh, one of the avatars, and you've got a specific function in the operating room. You've got a whole bunch of things you've got to learn. Uh, there are a variety of different uh, 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 resources that are available to you in the environment that you can pull up. You saw the screens. Uh, uh, of the of the uh, f you know the different physiologic functions being displayed, you can pull up X-rays, a variety of other kinds of things. So it's it's a very uh, media-rich uh, environment that has all of the kinds of of knowledge base that you need to perform well inside uh, an emergency room uh, situation. And uh, what's important is to learn to coordinate those activities with your other team members. Uh, you hear the voiceover, so you operate this with a voiceover IP command. Uh, 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 the, there's an instructor view. The instructor can change things, can, can uh, have the patient go into defibrillation, for example, all of a sudden. Uh, there are a variety of different kinds of things that, that can come along, and you are, are supposed to... Uh, Press the right side, that. please. Is, are you on the left side, sir? I think I'm on the left side. Oh, yeah, you're right. The Mithorax is on the left side. I'm sorry. Good catch. So, um, then one other kind of thing we, we took just as a, as, a, as a sort of example, we took the, the, the uh, Virtual Heroes uh, uh, training simulation you saw and converted it into a town hall meeting. Take possibly one more question before we uh, end this town council meeting for today. No, yes, sir. You? Yes, Speaker, I'm truly frustrated with what's going on. Um, after last fall's vote on Bill 189, where uh, you didn't pass a bill on a luxury tax on fuel consumption, uh, we worked hard to elect you, and all you're doing is catering to oil lobbyists and perpetuating the war in Iraq, and I think I might have to uh, throw my support in another direction. Okay. Well, we're definitely trying to elicit responses and input from all parties and all interest groups. 
Okay, so that's basically the idea. Uh, the idea is to take a, 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 a set of technologies that are currently being used for uh, military training uh, and to readapt them, to repurpose them for other kinds of, of uh, useful purposes, particularly for peace and conflict resolution. As I said at the beginning, uh, the change of uh, war has changed significantly uh, in the last uh, two decades uh, since the end of the Cold War. And one of the things that's happening that, that I think we need to take, uh, take into uh, uh, consideration is that currently uh, wars are most frequently ended in negotiated settlements. If we're going to turn the corner uh, and, uh, and, and make these negotiations useful and make them last, we have to train people in the skills and knowledge that it takes to uh, address the needs uh, and uh, engage with people uh, in, uh, on both sides, to be able to see things from a variety of different perspectives, to co-author the narrative of a peaceful solution. Uh, and it seems to me that these kinds of tools are one opportunity uh, for doing that. Thanks for your attention. Hi, I have two questions. I hope you can address both. First of all, um, with the recruitment tool, as you know better than I, males are much more prone to play these types of games than females. Has there been any sort of investigation into developing online tools that would actually attract uh, females? therefore considering a military career, problem solvers, leaders. The second thing is if you're using this for all of these sorts of developmental, progressive growth sorts of behaviors in the Army, what, if anything, has been done to try to deal with the fact that at least current statistics show that 25% of the females in the military report having been raped by their colleagues? Thank you. Yeah, those are uh, really terrible statistics. Uh, and uh, as far as uh, 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 people trying to develop uh, games that uh, are appealing or these kind of simulation technologies that uh, appeal to women. There's a very uh, terrific uh, computer science uh, artist, media person named Mary Flanagan uh, in New York uh, and she uh, she's developed, she has a, uh, she, she actually created a company called Games for Girls which was for, uh, for inner city girls. Um, She's gone on to do a variety of other things. She has a very large support from the NSF, National Science Foundation, to support that, uh, that work. So there are people trying to address these uh, issues of, of making games that, uh, and online sorts of stuff that appeal to uh, women as well. Actually, the statistics of women involved uh, uh, in games is pretty incredible. Uh, you know, something like 40% of of, uh, of people online these days or playing games are women. Uh, increasingly, women are playing games. So I, I, that's one, one issue. My concern, however, is not with gaming. <laughs> I'm looking at using this technology for uh, creating opportunities to learn by doing, uh, to create media-rich environments that allow us to uh, provide the kind of knowledge base and tools that, that come together in, in a particular kind of event situation. Uh, and so the, the, the co-principal um, co investigators of my project are uh, Casey Wallace is, is a, a, an activist lawyer in uh, the Durham, North Carolina era, area. She's a law professor at North Carolina uh, Central Univer uh, Law School. Uh, she's trained in um, uh, conflict management and resolution. That's her area. 
the other person uh, from the uh, Peace and Conflict Resolution Center is uh, Natalia Marivitskaya, who's a very famous negotiator. Uh, and the, uh, uh, so we have a team of people, and, and about uh, most of our, our uh, uh, field operatives uh, in this project are, turn out to be uh, women. So we, we hope we can address these issues. Uh, we don't think that there, uh, this particular technology is not focused around shooting guns at people, and uh, it's around assistance, and typically games of, of that sort uh, are appealing to females. So, uh, you know, The Sims, for example, is wildly popular among uh, young women uh, precisely because uh, it, it taps into a lot of the kinds of nurturing and caring kinds of, of um, types of issues that, that appeal most uh, to uh, them as opposed to shooting and killing stuff. So, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we want to address those issues. You know, I think that that is actually on the agenda, not for us. Uh, that's not something that we're involved with. Uh, but I do think that, that, that using these kinds of uh, 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 training modules for uh, sensitivity training, that is totally the kind of thing that this is for. Uh, and so uh, I'm not aware, I'm not part of any project like that, but I, I would not be surprised uh, if it weren't being used because uh, I, I do think it is a, a, a useful approach. No, I've got a mic up here. Uh, yep. Uh, are you saying that we're going to use these games to replace hands-on experience, first question. Second question is, where is the disconnect between our current leaders in the United States Army that have, that have been brought up with these games and what's happening in Iraq? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the answer to your first question is no, I don't think we're going to replace um, uh, hands-on personal experience. Uh, this is not a substitute for that at all. Um, turn, you know, hands-on personal experience uh, in the military is frequently extraordinarily costly, and so one way to be able to train uh, large-scale cooperative uh, 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 you know, operations uh, is in a cost-effective way is to do simulation. Uh, simulation is only uh, part of it, however, those ultimately interface with uh, actual real uh, experiences. So, no, we, I don't think we're going to do that, but the idea is that if you uh, train people, so, you know, you can see from the, the type of environment we're talking about, the, you know, the people playing here uh, can use multiple languages, They're, they can be sensitized to a variety of different kinds of, of uh, scenarios and situations. Uh, uh, through group interaction, in, in, particularly in the after-action review, uh, it's possible for people to really see what, you know, how, to, how to improve their performance in a given concrete situation of this sort. So uh, it, it's it's, it's practice leading up to uh, field operations, and field operations, uh, uh, you know, are things that you need to, to experience firsthand. But these are, these are meant to be tools to train uh, for that. It's not going to replace it at all. Um, there are uh, obviously kinds of interesting ideas one could have about uh, creating simulations where, you know, Palestinians, uh, and, um, and Israelis perhaps discuss different alternatives uh, to, you know, s solve their, uh, their, their conflict in, uh, in, a partic in, a, in an environment that actually mirrors the situation uh, as a way, as, as an, you know, as a way to avoid actual conflict and a way to re lead towards a reasoned discussion about these things. So it's not going to replace it. Uh, it's meant to be a teaching aid to uh, uh, to do that, and why don't the military? Why does uh, the military does use these things? Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, they're they're not uh, they haven't used them as effectively as they should, in my view. Um, uh, I did a very long study of the first one that was that's launched the whole thing, which was called the Battle of '73 Easting, which was in the first Gulf War, uh, and the, 
it's very interesting to, to see that the military commanders who actually had trained on simulators before the Battle of 73 Easting, which was a major victory for the U.S., uh, uh, later, and, and who were the sort of uh, poster children that went around to Washington and, and pled the case for, uh, for you know, uh, large-scale simulation as a way to, to train for warfare. Uh, uh, they've subsequently come out and, and argued against it uh, in very interesting ways. I mean, they, they feel that, that it hasn't, you know, that, that uh, the military is not, is spending all this money on stuff and not really paying attention to uh, providing the right kinds of material and so forth for people in the field and that the people in Washington don't know what, really what's going on in the field and that's one of the, bi the big issues. So I, I think there are other issues besides, uh, besides the use of simulation that's at stake here uh, and, and I don't see how this, this could hurt. <laughs> Um, I was just curious, I know you're talking about the simulations in the job force and school and education and stuff like that, but is this something that you're going to be directing more towards the general public? And if so, do you think that if we start doing away with the violence in video games that it's going to be as more um, readily consumed by the general public? Um. You know, I don't. You know, I think that that uh, violence in video games is a very uh, difficult topic, one really fraught with a lot of uh, problems, and also not with an awful lot of data uh, supporting. You know, the, the the impact of violence uh, in video games uh, uh, as a, as a way of uh, perpetrating violence. Uh, I mean, I've been teaching video games in classes for the last decade. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've had troubled students uh, that weren't in video game classes. <laughs> and uh, so I don't really, un you know, I, don't, I have an issue with that, that thesis. Uh, and that's why I said that I think, you know, I don't, I don't know if we're going to be able to break this, this cycle of violence. But, I mean, the world is a very violent place right now. But there are opportunities, and the opportunities are uh, uh, focusing in on those positive moments, the thing that around the, the fact that, that most warfare at the moment is ending in some form of, of negotiated settlement. And the reason for that is because neither side has the, has the power to control and, 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 and produce a victory. Uh, so we're going to be living in a world if it's moving, if it's going to move forward, and I, I see, I see conflict resolution as as a growth industry. Uh, when you think about water, when you think about energy, when you think about food issues, uh, and so, it seems to me that we need to focus on on th those kinds of areas where we can make a difference, and this is is one of them. Uh, we're going to have to change a lot of our views about things if we're going to change uh, this the cycle of violence that ends up in video games that is foregrounded by the ideology of these video games, uh, it seems to me that's the, that's, that's the crucial thing. Great, great question. Do you, do you have evidence that um, indicates how people behave in the real world after they have been taught in simulation, whether it, it's war games or any other kind? Because I think I, I'd be interested in that. And second, do you foresee a time where, where all war would be played out as a simulation as opposed to being need, uh, the need to play out as a, as a real event where real destruction, real death, real uh, things happen? Um, you know, there, there are studies about uh, how people perform in simulations. They're not, you know, I, in preparation for this, uh, Opportunity to talk to you. I actually, uh, you know, did a lot of uh, additional research on you know what's been done recently uh, with these kinds of studies. And to be honest with you, there aren't many studies that really look at uh, that measure this and measure it effectively. There are uh, people who you know who who argue that it's it's doing. There's very interesting work on addiction uh, and the use of. Uh, computer games to re-stimulate the, the parts of the brain that are, are destroyed through drug use. 
uh, and that kind of uh, uh, is, is a very interesting thing. I think those kinds of those kinds of researchers are going to go forward. Um, uh, I'm hoping. I mean, part of our study is going is 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 to result in a, a study to compare how people perform in the video game, uh, in the uh, game-based learning environment versus the paper simulation. We're producing both a paper simulation and the game simulation. Uh, one group of students will do the paper simulation. Two other groups of students are going to do the game simulation, and we'll see how it works out. Um, and we're also using experts, uh, former graduates of the program, uh, uh, the Rotary Center program. It's a, they have seven centers around the world. Uh, and we're using graduates of that program to test the system to see what they think. You know, I mean, these are experienced uh, um, field operatives. And so we, we hope we'll learn something from that. Um, you know, that, th that thing, that question you asked about, will this simulation become the real? Um, that scares the hell out of me. Um, you know, I really think that's where we're headed. Um, uh, honestly, that's, that's, what, that's one of the things that sort of motivated me by this topic. Um, I, was, I was the one who, who took the video of, Jim Thorpe, of Jack Thorpe at the Moves Institute. Uh, I wasn't supposed to be, I had it under, you know, had it under my pocket. <laughs> And here he is talking about Ender's Game, and I had just given a lecture to my students about Ender's Game and how, what an incredible vision that is and how scary it, it, it might be. And here's, here's these same people, here's the military people, you know, psych, recycling that same metaphor, but using it and talking about, about coordinating attacks through a video game uh, with, you know, friendly forces uh, that are not part of a government. <laughs> inside Iraq. I think that's scary. Um, and, you know, I don't know what, uh, what you know. It would be very interesting if, uh, so my hope is that the UN, for instance, I hope we're successful with this project and that, we're use, that we produce a useful tool. And I would like to see it be used by the UN. And I do think that uh, it would contribute to solving these kinds of problems. Well, my response would be, would, um, and I can understand why you would be afraid. I think it's most reasonable people would be afraid. But do you see a scenario where that would become, that that would eliminate the need to have real tanks, to have real uh, F-35s or whatever, real bombers, to drop real bombs, that, that the need to do those kind of things would be satisfied in a, in a virtual environment Therefore, it doesn't have to exist in a real environment. Uh, you know, I really like to believe that. Uh, I would really like to see that that, that, that is an outcome. Uh, it's, all, it's a little like, uh, you know, Star Trek. Uh, and uh, I'd kind of I'd like to see that. Uh, you know, I, I think, that, I think that, that the world is changing in a very rapid way right now. Uh, and I think that uh, if, you, if you look at the, the, the things that are going on with respect to globalization, uh, we talk about globalization as if uh, that is a, you know, what we mean by globalization are U.S. multinational companies using the rest of the world. But actually, uh, th there's uh, other things going on, right, where China in particular is using those same networks to develop its own industrial base and its own scientific base. So I don't, you know, I, I think the world's going to, I think, I think we're changing uh, things to an extent. It would be great if we could have these kinds of uh, conf conflict resolution technologies that would take the place of real war, but I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> uh, I uh, heard a talk by a uh, physics graduate who had a Russian heritage. And his talk was on war and peace and the human race. And it may have been a surprise to him, but at the end, he thought maybe war is sexy and peace is not. And previous people have sort of asked what I was thinking about. Do, do you think, uh, while this is part of changing the psychology of the human race, maybe, maybe, <laughs> we hope? Do you mean that, that we might start thinking that peace is sexy? 
Yeah, I hope so. I think so. You mean, I think that's, uh, I think we've got to start doing that, you know, and I think that that's the point. I think that's, that's really the point, that we've got to commit ourselves to changing these things. Uh, I, I, you know, I think the evidence is out there since 2000. I mean, I've, I was showing you some statistics from the Uppsala conflict database project, which is massive, and they've been collecting data on conflicts around the world for decades. And those data show that the, you know, that, that things aren't moving towards uh, 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 victories, uh, that, that things are moving much more towards, you know, low, sort of civil war type, low intensity kinds of uh, engagements uh, 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 directed against the population, against civilians, and uh, that ultimately you don't get you don't get uh, settlements that are lasting. So, you know, that to me makes peace sexy. We've got to work on this. We've got to make this happen.